Michael Burry predicts another market crash. This is the index fund bubble explained. Now, Dr. Michael Burry, as you likely know, was one of the fund managers who correctly predicted the last financial crisis and profited greatly from it, a story that was portrayed in the popular movie, The Big Short. Because of this, when Michael Burry speaks, the market listens. And because of his interview, there's been a lot of discussions over the last months about index funds, whether or not they're in a bubble, and what that means for regular investors like you and me. In this video, we'll be covering three main things. And the first is really understanding Michael Burry's claims when he calls index funds a bubble. The second is we'll actually be breaking down his arguments to understand whether some of them are valid and in which cases, or if some arguments don't hold as much water for regular investors. And third, we'll end with what impact this has for investors like you and me, as well as some strategies for how we can approach investing depending on how much you agree or disagree with Dr. Burry. We've got a lot to cover, so let's jump into it. And if you're new here, take a second to subscribe to gain access to more investment content like this in the future. Now, oftentimes when hearing claims or reading articles, you're getting a secondhand account of the information, which is why I like going to the source if possible, which is exactly what we'll do with the Bloomberg article that came from the initial Michael Burry email interview. The title of the article, which drew a lot of attention, was The Big Short's Michael Burry Explains Why Index Funds Are Like Subprime CDOs. CDOs are collateralized debt obligations that helped cause the financial crisis. And while this title draws a lot of attention, and I'm sure a lot of clicks, unfortunately, it doesn't do a lot of justice to what Michael Burry was actually discussing in his email interview. Burry argued that index fund inflows are distorting prices for bonds and stocks in the market in a similar way that CDOs distorted the subprime mortgage market over a decade ago. Also similar similar to how Bloomberg's title is distorting the core arguments of Michael Burry. See, index funds and CDOs are two completely different things. However, Michael Burry is arguing that they're having similar effects within their respective markets, namely distorting the price and price discovery process within each of those markets. Now, even that sounds a little bit complicated, so let's break down Michael Burry's arguments, and he really has three main points, at least when it comes to index funds. The first argument is that passive investing has removed price discovery from the equity markets. Now, when Michael Burry talks about price discovery, what he means is that when you're investing in a passive index fund, you're not doing any fundamental analysis on deciding whether or not to buy the stock, you're simply buying the index fund, which in then in turn buys a collection of stocks in the market, regardless of whatever their fundamentals are. And by fundamentals, we're talking about business performance. So while a stock might be doing very well and the underlying business isn't growing as quickly, then that stock can become overvalued, but that'll still be a stock purchased by index funds because there's no fundamental analysis in that decision. So this is basically the first argument Barry has on index funds. Even if the market is overvalued, people continuing to invest in passive index funds can continue to inflate this bubble, so to speak, until finally investors realize that the stocks have become way too overvalued, and then the process quickly reverses. And that gets to Burry's second argument about index funds, which is their hidden liquidity risk. To explain this, he provides an example with the Russell 2000 index, which is an index of small capitalization stocks. So many of these stocks are small and don't really get traded a lot in the open markets. However, because they're included in these indices, large amount of capital flows into these stocks or potentially out of, depending on flows into or out of the underlying index fund. When this really matters is when you have a lot of redemptions or withdrawals from index funds. This can easily and quickly happen if prices start to fall and investors panic and pull money out of index funds in a relatively short period of time. A good analogy Bray provides is a crowded theater. Even if everyone is rushing for the exits, the exit door is still the same size it's always been. This means the next time people are rushing out of index funds in emotional panic selling, there isn't going to be a lot of liquidity, especially for those smaller capitalization stocks. And what you're going to see is that those price declines are going to be much more significant, at least in the short term. And the third caveat that Burry mentions is the risk of derivatives that some of these funds use in their day-to-day -day operations. This argument is a little more nuanced and applies more to leverage ETFs or inverse ETFs, which we'll discuss a little bit more later. But these are the three core arguments. So let's start to address Burry's first argument, which is index funds and price discovery, which leads into are index funds really a bubble? Now, this is a live market dashboard that I've created just to help get a sense of generally where we stand in the market at any given time and can be used to help gauge expectations on future risk and return. If you're part of my private group, you can access this by going to the spreadsheet library and clicking on portfolio management live market dashboard. But effectively, if you look at the top right, which is market valuation levels for US stocks, at least compared to the two core metrics of general market valuations, 
namely the CAPE ratio and the market cap to GDP ratio, market valuations in the US are quite high relative to historic average ranges. This means with high valuations now, it's not likely we're going to see the high rates of return we've seen over the last 10 years in the over double digit annual percentages, and over the next maybe eight years or so, we're more likely to see returns from the S&P 500 of maybe around four to 5% per year. And these aren't just my numbers either. Vanguard, which manages about 50% of all passive index funds, also suggests that investors lower their expectations for future returns from US stocks. In this case, over the next 10 years, they're expecting roughly a four to 6% annualized return for domestic stocks. Now that could come in the form of a roughly sideways market we've seen since the beginning of 2018, or also possibly a more significant decline and drawdown in stocks, followed by a subsequent recovery. So I think it's fair to say that the overall markets that index funds are investing in are likely a bit overvalued or at least expensive at this time. However, the question remains, is that really the primary fault of the index funds or is it a possible combination of factors which might include the index funds but also consider the low interest rate environment and other factors that could impact the valuation for stocks. Vanguard published a paper in 2018 titled Setting the Record Straight, The Truth About Indexing, which helps address some of these concerns. One finding was that despite the increase in passive ETFs or index funds in the market over the last 25 plus years, there hasn't been a strong correlation or increase in overall stock market volatility or price change. In addition, despite becoming an ever more increasing portion of the assets that are invested in the market, index funds still represent a relatively small percentage of the trading volume that's done in the markets. In this case, in 2018, a still full 95% of trades were done from active managers or retail investors like you and me, rather than purchases or sales driven by index fund flows. Now, regarding Bray's second point, his claim was that the exit door is still very small for these index funds, which could make price drops more significant, particularly for small capitalization stocks, should we see a lot of investors sell out of index funds suddenly. On the graph to the right, we can see the number of public companies split out by their market capitalizations, large caps at the bottom, followed by mid cap, small cap, and then micro caps in the dark blue on the top. The concern is a lot of money moving out at once could significantly impact especially these micro cap and small cap stocks that don't simply have as much trading volume as the large cap stocks. However, the second graph helps at least address this partially by taking a look at the market cap proportion of companies grouped by size. So this would be, for instance, in a total stock market index, what percentage of the funds are invested in large cap versus mid cap versus small cap, and then in the very top blue, micro cap companies. In this sense, if there's large outflows from the index funds, most of those outflows will be going to large caps, which do have the trading volume to generally support those index fund redemptions without seeing significant adverse price movement beyond what's normally expected. Put another way, the small caps and micro caps will only make up a small fraction of ETF selling if the index funds start to sell off. However, Bray's concern could still hold because there are some index funds that focus specifically on these small cap and micro cap stocks. For instance, the Vanguard small cap ETF, ticker symbol VB, invests exclusively in these small capitalization stocks and it has total net assets of over $90 billion. There can be a very fast and sudden drop off in the price of those securities. So this argument I think actually holds water, at least specifically regarding the smaller capitalization stocks and the number of indices that are specifically tied to just those stocks. But if you'll notice after the sudden decline in 2018, there was actually a very quick and sharp recovery. And this is the kind of volatility that I think Burry thinks will be a little more exacerbated by the increasing amount of funds that are allocated towards passive ETFs, and particularly the amount that's being invested in small caps that typically have lower trading volumes. While not directly related to passive indexing, the Wall Street Journal actually just recently came out with an article discussing how some stocks that are not very liquid or don't see a lot of trading volume are seeing explosive swings in the stock price either positive or negative following their quarterly release of company earnings. So what this means and a potential takeaway is we can likely expect that during future declines, we may see more volatility, at least in the short term, than we have in the past. Now, this isn't something that should necessarily scare off investors, but it can mean to be ready for these potential opportunities that come up to invest when there's excessive fear in the market. Now, finally, to briefly address Burry's third claim, which was concern over the derivative use in some index-based funds, I think primarily where you see the biggest concern of that is over leveraged ETFs and inverse ETFs. This is an ETF heat map on Finviz, and it helps sort of visualize what ETFs are available in the market 
But the ones that we're really concerned about here are these leverage and inverse ETFs. And there's leverage and e inverse ETFs from other sectors as well. But in this case, we'll be just looking at the leveraged and inverse ETFs of the main US stock indices. It's these funds in particular that utilize the derivatives and options trading that make these funds much more risky, especially in a very adverse tail end scenario compared to the standard index funds that 99% of investors are investing in. The example of these derivative strategies blowing up and causing severe losses was actually something that we saw in February of 2018, where you had an inverse volatility product that lost over 80% and eventually over 95% of its value in just a couple days. Basically, this inverse VIX product was betting that stocks weren't going to move much over the next month. When stocks suddenly started crashing in February of 2018, the derivatives and options that made up the product effectively lost all of their value overnight. If you stick with regular index funds like the majority of people do and avoid these leveraged and inverse ETFs, then you won't have to worry about that risk that Burry is talking about. So we've discussed Michael Burry's claims as well as analyze them in the context of other evidence that we have to help get a better understanding of each of his arguments. So with all this new information, let's take a step back and reevaluate the question, are index funds a bubble? And then as a follow-up to that, depending on your answer, how would you as an investor best develop an investment strategy around that? So million dollar question, are index funds a bubble? Understand that index funds effectively track the market. So asking if index funds are in a bubble is like asking if the overall stock market is in a bubble. And while I don't really like using the term bubble, I think there is evidence to support that markets are at relatively high valuation levels at least compared to historical ranges. This means that returns from investing in an index fund like the S&P 500 going forward are likely going to be lower than what we've seen in the past, at least since 2009. Lowering expectations on future returns from index funds to around four to five or four to six percent per year instead of the traditional eight to 10 percent per year would likely better mentally prepare investors for what investing in an index fund will likely be like over the next eight to 10 years. Now, we don't know exactly how those lower returns might actually Actually play out. It could be in the form of a sideways market that we've seen for roughly about two years, or it could be more of a dramatic crash in prices, maybe down minus 30 or 40 percent, and then a subsequent recovery over a period of time. However, if we do see a sudden crash, similar to what we saw in February of 2018, or in the last quarter of 2018, but in a much larger scale, then we could potentially see some significant price swings that could be in part exacerbated by emotional selling of index funds. However, when that happens, those significant declines will likely only be in the short run and may present an excellent long-term investing opportunity. This is something that can benefit both investors in index fund as well as individual stock selectors. So while the market may be a bit overvalued now, there's no need to panic as long as you continue saving and investing. Keep a long-term focus and stick with your investment plan and strategy. To that end, I'd like to show you something from my Invest First Pay Down Debt Calculator, which we'll be using to model portfolio performance investing in an index fund by dollar cost averaging over time. Again, for reference, another resource in the spreadsheet library. So I won't go over all the assumptions, but this is effectively representing someone who has about 5,000 to invest in every year, and that amount grows slowly over time. So had that person started investing in the S&P 500 in 1996, and they were 100% or fully investing all of their excess savings into it, despite seeing two recessions, seeing stock declines of over 40% in each of them, this person's net worth would still be on a very positive trajectory. And this is why for long-term investors who continue to invest in the market each and every month or each and every year, you don't need to be as concerned with sudden price declines. And in fact, if you have many years to invest, you should really look forward to them because it's at these times when prices are depressed that you actually get the most investment for your money and achieve the highest rates of return on that capital. So this may be looking at a glass half full, but it's really a win-win situation. If stocks continue to go up, then the amount of assets that you have appreciates. If stocks go down, then you can buy more at higher rates of return. However, if you're still a bit concerned about the relatively high valuations, you could also continue to invest, but you could decide to have a portion of that set aside in cash to take advantage of future investment opportunities in the future when forward returns are a bit more favorable. Or if you're not completely debt-free, you could decide to allocate some of your savings to debt pay down, which will provide you a risk-free rate of return and also increase your overall financial health. So overall, I think Burry brings up some fair concerns However, for the average investor with a long-term mindset, this isn't something you necessarily need to worry about, as long as you're aware of where the market stand in valuations and have reasonable expectations for future returns, then you shouldn't have to worry and you should continue to stick with your investment plan. 
Overall, I hope you found this useful. Thought I would give my two cents on this since there's been a lot of discussion over the recent months, which is a good thing for the investment community. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. It's the best way for me to know which content you guys enjoy the most and want to see more of in the future. Until then, thank you so much for watching. My name's Michael, and I will see you in the next video.